Welcome to my mate in HR. This is another one of our career sessions where we talk to somebody about their career and a bit about their journey. Today we have the lovely Kate Spencer with us. Kate is a freelance copywriter who has had a really interesting career and worked in lots of different places and with lots of different companies. And we've asked her today to come along to talk to Lucy and I to show a little bit about her journey with us. So thank you for joining us, Kate. Thank you so much for asking me. No worries. So um, just to kick off, Talk to us a bit about what your career journey has been that kind of got you to, to where you are now. Well, uh, I think like a lot of people who go into the, with the world of marketing, it was a slightly accidental uh, pathway. Um, so my uh, early interest was in psychology and I really wanted to pursue something along those lines. But my family thought the social sciences were the equivalent of the dark arts. So I did something very sensible. I, I studied languages and I went to secretarial college and I started with a six week temporary assignment for a, a company in the industrial gases arena with, with which I know you are very familiar. <laughs> yeah. um, and what started out as six weeks turned into 13 years, which I couldn't wow. have seen at the time. Um, but it was uh, a fantastic environment, very structured, very corporate, um, professional environment. And because I came in as a generalist, I knew nothing about it whatsoever. Um, and this, it was ideally suited to me because there were so many learning opportunities. There is not a single industry that is untouched by industrial gases somewhere along the line. Um, so there's always something new to learn, um, new to feed off, and, and that was great for me. Um, so I ended up progressing through a series of strategic marketing roles as, as an analyst and, uh, and, and strategic marketer. And one of the things that um, proved really pivotal for me was that um, I had, uh, I've been to university, it didn't, didn't suit me, and so I I'd, I'd decided to, to go back into the world of work. And because my employer had a very uh, structured graduate scheme, I was always being told, well, if you want to get anywhere, go back to university, go to a proper red brick institution, get yourself a degree and then get yourself on the graduate programme. And I'd sort of resisted this for a number of years. And uh, I went to see the HR director or VP of HR, as he was then, um, sort of talk towards the end of that time and said, look, you know, I'm, I'm looking to potentially change direction and uh, look at other areas of the business. Do you still think I need a degree? And he said, well, do you? And I had to pause for a moment and reflect on that. Uh, and he sort of uh, opened his arm with this great expansive gesture and said, this isn't important. You know, if you were my daughter, I'd advise you to, to pack a, a, a backpack and, and go around the world and, and do something else. <laughs> which was a little bit destabilizing um so he'd clearly had a, a bit of an epiphany and I sort of felt almost as though this pressure that had been built up over the course of you know over a decade had suddenly been punctured and it was job done I'd accomplished what I'd set out to do which was was validate my career path without the conventional degree and all of the sort of attendant structure and process that went with it um, and it was at that point I thought, my work here is done. I'm going to go and do something else. There's a, there's a big world out there. Now, obviously, I look back and, and that company was a superb employer. Um, and I think we all took it for granted at the time just how well they looked after their people. Um, and, it, you know, I was I subsequently learned that not every employer uh, is, is like that. So, you know, I, I realize very much now what side my bread was buttered, but it was that perfect point for me to go off and do something else and explore some other talents and skills that I had started developing, but, you know, really wanted to see where they would take me. Cool. Brilliant. So what, where did you go then? Did you, did you bugger off around the world or? Well, I did not, unfortunately, no. Um, that was a missed opportunity. So because I had been in this environment that, as I say, touches every industry, but nobody really knows anything about, um, it would be so often that, you know, you'd meet someone in a pub or a, some social setting and they'd say, what, what do you do for a living? Um, and it was always, air what, industrial who? I don't understand any of that. So I really wanted to go and work for a well-known consumer Ooh. brand. That would be a household name. And everybody would, would go, oh, yeah, I get, I get it. I get what you do. Um, so I ended up 
I decided that I was only going to pursue jobs with a relocation opportunity to get me out of my um, cosy little rut that I was in at that time. Um, and I ended up with a with a choice of jobs. I was quite lucky that I had three second interviews and three offers on the table. Um, and I chose mm-hmm. to go to a, a consumer durables manufacturer that, you know, most people have got one of their appliances sat in their kitchen somewhere. Um, uh, where I, I became a senior product manager and I was still focused on very technical aspects. So I had the, the product that nobody wanted to touch because it was too complex and scientific. Um, but it was, it was a great opportunity just to do something incredibly different. That then proved to be my next stepping stone because I worked with a roster of creative agencies on um, packaging design and uh, various other sort of marketing functions. And I was actually headhunted to become an account director by one of the agencies on my roster. Um, and so to go to the dark side rather than client side was was obviously irresistible. <laughs> and that was that was uh, although it wasn't a planned progression, it all sort of made sense as this continuous evolution and taking skills in different directions. Mm-hmm. Um, very happy time there. And then one day out of the blue, I came into work and was asked down to the boardroom and I was told that I was being made redundant and it came absolutely out of nowhere. So I took myself off for a a cup of tea and a good cry. And um, I drove home because I I was working in Cheltenham and uh, living it on the South Coast. And in the time it took me to drive home, I went through the entire cycle of panic. How am I going to pay the mortgage? What am I going to do? My life is over. And with that sort of two or three hours driving just to process everything, by the time I got home, I was eerily calm and composed. And I went out with some friends and we, we had dinner and they said, look, you know, clearly it's just not hit you yet, Kate, but it will come. You know, this is this is going to hit you badly. And actually, I felt incredibly at peace with it because my whole career having been built around, you know, um, diligence and and sort of trying to create a, a, you know, a a secure situation for myself and, you know, being in very stable employers and all of this, the worst had happened. And yet the world hadn't stopped spinning on its axis. Mm. I was all right. And my sort of philosophy was, I will get through this. Something will come up. And I will make something happen. And as long as my my motto is pretty much eat well, be warm and everything else will take care of itself. Um, So I started to apply for uh, account director positions and I went to a few interviews. And up until this point, I'd been studying for a diploma in copywriting. And it was my sort of three to five year plan that I would try and transition into some form of copywriting role and Uh, You know, once I got experience and built a portfolio and was, you know, employable. And actually this this sort of cataclysmic event that had happened taught me that the best laid plans can go awry. Why not just throw yourself into a into a gig now? Why not bring forward the future and, and, you know, see what happens? So I put together um, a, a, a sort of quasi portfolio of stuff that I'd done for various businesses and um, you know, marketing materials and, and what have you. Um, got an opening um, for an interview uh, in a barn in Surrey and uh, walked in with a confidence and a poise that I really don't possess <laughs> uh, at all. Um, so we, we had a bit of a chat and I said, look, you know, at the end of the day, this is, this is a six week gig. Take me on. What's the worst that can happen? You can get rid of me in six weeks if it doesn't work out. Um, and actually that led to four years of a beautiful relationship. <laughs> so during that time, I was working in uh, on business to business accounts and the agency was predominantly B2B with some B2C. And of course, people wanted to work on the well-known brands and the exciting stuff. And I really found my niche in obscure technology that nobody really understood terribly well or found particularly engaging. And to me, it was like, um, you know, assimilating this information, putting together the pieces, um, looking at how you could make ostensibly quite dull subject matter more exciting was the same kind of kick that people get out of doing a crossword puzzle or a Sudoku. You know, there was a there was a challenge to be cracked. So it absolutely suited me down to the ground. 
Um, so that was the start of my copywriting career. <laughs> And so then, were you employed there then? I was. I was on a payroll yeah. and I had paid leave and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Good old days, I vaguely I recall mean, those. Absolutely, what a halcyon period. And it was, it was a very exciting time as well because it was a small agency poised for growth. And in, in the space of four years, we went from 12 of us and a dog to, you know, well over 100 people. Wow. Um, it really was a tremendous growth period and um you know a sort of one of the original crew um it, i think we're looking back it's easy to see now how we we were all behind driving that growth um and and really being proud of the b2b space because it's not a poor relation to consumer marketing at all um so that was really quite a, an incredible experience and uh, and the other thing i, I would say you know for, for any freelancer is cut your teeth in an agency environment you cannot just go straight into um, working with clients before you understand all of the dynamics all of the pitfalls all of the um, the best practices that you can acquire and develop along the way which will you know which will really give you um, so much so much more of a, a, a value-added offering than you would otherwise so when did you make the transition from the, the regular paycheck and that sort of thing to what you're doing now to start your own business? Well, this is this is an interesting one. Um, so because I'd come from a background, you know, large corporate background, 18,000 employees, you know, all felt like extended family. Then to a consumer goods company with maybe 250 employees to an agency with 12 and some. Um, I'd always thought that I, I would... Um, I wouldn't be of the right temperament to be self-employed because I was too risk averse and I liked the security and the regularity of, you know, my paycheck coming in um, and the ability to plan and have, you know, sort of financial predictability. Um, and I had some health issues early 2010 and my surgeon said, well, what you need to do is get rid of the stress in your life. You know, the 12 hour days, the commute, which was sometimes, you know, three or four hours on a bad day, mm -hmm. um, you know, you need to really de-stress and take some time out. Can you can you afford to take a sabbatical? So I thought, well, can I afford not to? So I left my lovely job and um, I had a, a couple of weeks of rattling around the house thinking, what am I going to do with this year? What am I, I going to do to make it productive or pivotal or something, you know, part of this growth process? Um, and within a couple of weeks, I had somebody ring me and say, oh, I, I, I saw you on LinkedIn. Are you um, are you available at the moment? And I thought, well, what do I say? And then the panic set in of what if I say no? You know, where's the money going to come from? I don't have a plan. So I said yes. And then the phone rang again and someone said, oh, I hear you're an independent now. Is that so? And I'm thinking, <laughs> am I? Am I? Um, <laughs> And so my attitude was, well, I know I'm supposed to be, you know, taking things easy and and having a bit of a breather, but, you know, make hay while the sun shines because it's, you know, sure as hell going to be raining tomorrow. Um, and before I knew it, within a month, I was up to 70 hour weeks, which set the tone for <laughs> the next 10 years. <laughs> So it, it, it wasn't deliberate, but I think the freelance model worked very well for me because Unlike starting, you know, um, a, a typical startup business where you might have, for example, inventory and overheads and staff and all of the complexities that go with that. It was just me. Um, you know, it's a, a, a service business gun for hire. Um, and I already had everything I needed. And one of the things that I uh, found worked incredibly well for me is that I've been doing the working from home thing Um for 10 years now so the pandemic has been nothing new for me at all mm -hmm. um, but it was that ability to maintain relationships all over the world so most of my client base was in in the states in Europe in Asia um, and I was very well equipped to handle the if you like some of the the the, the isolation and the the lack of structure that can go with freelancing but for me, it worked beautifully because my concentration has always been best in splendid isolation, um, you know, rather than the, the sort of the, the buzz of a, a studio or whatever. So, um, so yeah, so that's how I got to where I am today. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. So yeah, some, some, some of it planful, some of it just, all right then. 
Absolutely, but I think that's that's the thing. I know some people who have a life plan and they have a spreadsheet and they have all the other kind of structured mechanisms to get them where they want to, to go and, and have a very singular vision. And it's been my experience that life doesn't accommodate those sorts of plans terribly well. And it can be very discombobulating to have life throw, um, you know, curveballs at you. Whereas for me, it was a question of, not necessarily having a rigid plan, but being very open to opportunity, mm -hmm. creating opportunity, developing it, nurturing it, and seeing where it would take you. Um, and the most important thing as well for me is that everything is about continuous learning. Now, I know a lot of people talk about it, um, and particularly in the corporate environment, now learning culture is becoming um, really important to a lot of businesses that are looking to be innovative and get beyond some of the, um, the the sort of limited mindsets that have, have served them well in the past, but maybe not so much today. Um, for me personally, I have to be continuously learning. My itchy little brain, if it weren't learning, would, um, would struggle to apply itself. So it's really just taking something that brings me tremendous pleasure and satisfaction and translating that into a professional context. Mm -hmm. That's always a, a good day, isn't it? When you can kind of... <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, the great thing is if you work across brands, you can really develop deep relationships with clients in the same way as you would with colleagues in the same office. Yeah. But the difference is that there is always something new and particularly in technology, which is my area of specialism, the pace of change is frantic. I mean, I look back on my industrial gases career and they are still using materials that I produced more than a decade. Well, we're talking probably 15 years ago, uh, because that the pace of change is almost like tectonic plate shift. Whereas if you look at, you know, the, the development of mobile devices, um, AI, machine learning, uh, the whole big data movement, nothing stands still for more than five minutes. So although it is a frenetic pace and you need considerable mental and physical stamina to keep up with it, again, if you have that appetite for learning, it is the ideal sector to be in because everything is characterized by constant change. So ever changing, yeah. Absolutely. So my so my little my little niche is um it, it's it's quite a symbiotic relationship. Brilliant. What would you say has been your looking back over your career to date, what would you say? your most challenging career moment has been? Um, I think it was probably realizing that I, I've always been a little bit different. Um, so now uh, with later diagnosis in life, I'm, I'm on the autistic spectrum. Um, I mean, working in tech, who'd have thunk it? Um, <laughs> and and that, <laughs> that helped me kind of overlay a framework on so much of my life and be able to, to understand it and interpret it through a very different lens. And, and suddenly everything started to make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think before, and, and this is the experience of many people who are diagnosed later in life, is that suddenly things fall into place. So I think there were there weren't any major challenges. Obviously, redundancy was perhaps you know a, a, a key moment, um, but life was really a sequence of small, fine grained challenges that made everything um, kind of more effortful. So mm. didn't necessarily, you know, I, I didn't necessarily have the, the, the flow and the clarity and the ease of interactions um, that, that, say, m many neurotypical might, uh, people might benefit from. And also, you know, looking back at my, um, my difficulties with university and the, the, the sort of the, the whole environment and, um, you know, not really working for me at the time, it helped me make sense of that. So the biggest struggle was not coming down the graduate pipeline and not having that sort of fairly visible trajectory. Um, but actually, I probably wouldn't have it any other way. I think um, particularly nowadays, you know, we, we have a generation of graduates who are not finding necessarily the fulfillment and the, the opportunities that they're looking for. They're certainly not finding um, the salaries that will enable them to, um, you know, to be able to, to, you know, buy a house, for example, get a foot on the housing ladder, because 
there is, um, you know, there is that expectation that there was years ago that you would go to university, you'd come out and you'd get a proper good job and you'd have a proper career path. And, and that's not always the case now. I think people are not getting the benefit of that clarity of direction. So for me personally, I don't think it's done me any harm. And I would actually say in terms of character, it's done me a tremendous amount of good. Okay, so on the flip side of that, What's your kind of career defining moment or your career defining highlight that you just go that that was awesome? Oh, um, there are a few days in my life that I can pick out as days that altered the course of my life irrevocably. Um, and one of those was back in my industrial gases background when we had a Myers-Briggs day okay. and we'd all done our um, MBTI uh, questionnaires and our whole division was assembled. And we went through the results and it was interesting for me because we arranged, there were 40 people in our division um, and I was the only woman and we were lined up from most extrovert to most introvert. And I was right at, almost out of the room on the <laughs> introvert end of the scale. And it made me realize uh, we did an exercise where we had a problem to solve and we were put into breakout groups. And when we were in a small group with three or four people, I was very comfortable sharing and contributing my ideas. When we reassembled again to share those ideas as a group, I was afraid to speak up. So someone else would pipe up with my idea and everyone would say, oh, that's, you know, excellent. Yeah, that's, that's a really good solution. And I think, wow, this is, this is inhibiting. It's inhibiting personally and professionally. Um, and because it was an environment that put great stock in extroversion, in salesmanship, in, you know, the ability to build rapport and be influential, um, I really was at a disadvantage. And I resolved that day that if I didn't have confidence, I was so shy, it was ridiculous. So I would just fake it till I could make it. And so I deliberately put myself in situations where I would have to volunteer for something, put my hand up for something, talk to people that terrified me, put myself in situations that terrified me. Um, and I was very lucky in that my line manager at that time was, was a great unofficial mentor. You know, he was never charged with mentoring me and it was never a formalized arrangement, you know, with, with the, you know, the, the benefit of a wider context. But he very much encouraged that approach. And that literally changed my life in so many respects. So I, I know that, um, you know, Myers-Briggs, some people love it, some people hate it. But for me personally, it brought a level of insight that I could, I could actually take action towards making substantive change in my life and uh, very much change for the better. That's excellent. Great. Well, I, yeah. And, and I think you're right. Some people love that sort of thing. Some people hate it. But I think it's, you can always learn something from it. Absolutely. Always... And the great thing is that it, pay, it played into my love of psychology. Um, marketing plays into my love of psychology and writing with my audience in mind, not the client. I mean, dear clients, I love you and I respect you, but you're not important to me. Your reader, your audience, your prospect and your customer are, are who is important to me. Mm -hmm. And it's that psychology of, you know, getting into the customer's mindset and identifying their needs, their wants, their drivers, their preferences and really focusing on and prioritizing those that makes the difference between, you know, copy that sells, content that sells, um, and just more white noise. Brilliant. Um, okay, so bearing in mind where you are today, what would you tell your younger 18 year old self? Oh, see, that's a difficult one because I, I, uh, I think my philosophy towards the, the time travel is that if you go back into the past and alter anything, then it's going to potentially have a, a ripple effect on the future and I might end up uh, somewhere completely different I, I could be you know, <laughs> I love that. down a mine <laughs> um, you can't answer that I'll disappear is what we're saying here. <laughs> I, I, might, I might cease to exist or I, you know I might be in Costa Rica um, I think I think for me the only thing which would have been beneficial to be aware of is the whole concept of neurodivergence at a younger age, because there are so many things that you can look at as, as either weaknesses or flaws or, or you know, development opportunities, which are not character, which are not ways of thinking, but it is how you are hardwired. 
um, on a neurological basis. And those are immutable. You cannot tweak and improve and refine and change and do the hard yards and all the rest of it. And you can expend a lot of energy trying to change or alter yourself when actually it's more of a matter of how do you align your circumstances and your setup to be more conducive and accommodating to that. So it would have been great to know about that stuff earlier, but in all fairness, there's nothing in my life I would change on the basis that somehow it's all worked out. <laughs> and it, it continues to be challenging. Um, it's not to say, you know, I'm, I'm living the dream and in this completely sort of serene place, not at all. Um, but let's face it, if, if 45 year old me tapped 18 year old me on the shoulder and said, look, do you want a bit of advice? Would I have listened? I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. I would have said, who's this, who's this woman who doesn't even dye her grey hair giving me advice? So. I would have been totally like, oh my God, you got fat. That <laughs> would have been my 18-year-old. <laughs> I would have been like, what it's did just, you do? We went to... It's interesting, Kate, you talk about di sort of diagnosis and how that helped you kind of relax into yourself. Mm. We were, we, the last podcast we did, we had a similar situation with somebody who was um, dyslexic. Mm -hmm. and he wasn't diagnosed I don't think till a bit later and struggled through st school mm -hmm. and thought he was stupid and something was wrong with him and and had a sort of similar light bulb moment when absolutely you know he got diagnosed yeah how amazing mm. how um okay so if you had a top career tip or life tip to share with our with our listeners and watchers what would that be oh um I think a lot is talked about purpose um, too much is talked about following your passion now that might sound a bit controversial but bear with me um, I think there are things in life that bring us tremendous joy and that might be you know hobbies it might be cooking it might be you know helping people it might might be any one of a number of things and people nowadays are told follow your dreams follow your passion the reality is that there isn't always scope in the world when you need to meet your financial obligations and give yourself a, you know, a basic level of security. It's not always possible to follow your passions. You, that, those might occur in a very contested space where you're very good at something and you enjoy something very much, but it would take virtuoso levels of achievement to really make it in a given field. The other thing that's really important, I think, as well, is that um, you need to keep some things back that are not in the work environment. So perhaps your passion is actually your counterpoint to work. Um, your purpose can be your counterpoint to work. Work does not have to be all consuming, said mm -hmm. she who did far too many 70 hour weeks. Um, but what does need to happen is that work needs to be in alignment with your values and your strengths. And I mean, by that, I mean your temperament as much as anything, your character. So if your work is in alignment with who you are, there's less resistance, there's less opportunity for boredom or frustration or a lack mm -hmm. of confidence, but you can keep your passions as that beautiful thing that you reward yourself with outside of work. And that can help keep your life in balance. Um, so as, as much as, you know, we, we should all be looking at following things that give us fulfillment, fulfillment is not necessarily realising dreams and having to make that, you know, part of your, your professional trajectory. Um, and there's, there's, there needs to be, you know, some, some room in there for something that's just for you and just for your own purposes. Brilliant. That's, yeah, I think that's absolutely, absolutely brilliant. And finally, what are your plans for the future? Um, my plans for the future are that I am very much staying within the, um, the space I currently occupy for the foreseeable. Um, I have been able to identify ways of um, tweaking my business model, making more accommodations for some life so it doesn't all become work heavy. Um, and... I can very much see that continuing, um, having, having the right tools and the right setup to be able to create structure and uh, in your work and to be able to minimize admin, minimize kind of non-value added activities. That's really important. Mm -hmm. um, so with all that kind of optimization taking place, you know, that's not in one big chunk of change, that's just continuous fine tuning. But what I 
tend to get the most satisfaction from is actually the relationships that I forge through work. Um, it is not purely the act of writing itself. You know, I, I, I don't get necessarily get some incredible catharsis or, you know, the equivalent <laughs> of the, the runner's high endorphins from writing. But what I love is the ability to understand what matters to someone and to be able to help them change their business through the content they create help them redefine the way that they look at their, their business, which is why I very much enjoy working with SMEs. And, and I think, I, think I, I met someone once who took corporate experience and had a, a, a real kind of um, enthusiasm for bringing that, that, that sort of level of expertise to, you know, and democratizing that into small business. <laughs> I mean, a, a, somebody or a Tracy, Tracy something, I think. <laughs> um, but that is very much where I see my efforts being focused because there are so many businesses who, um, particularly in the sort of, you know, early stages and, and when they're just starting to grow, don't necessarily have the resources or don't feel they can, um, you know, they, they can access the kind of services that are available to large corporates. And I think it's, you know, if you look at the way that small businesses are so instrumental in our economy, they make up the bulk of the companies in the UK. They make up the bulk of the employers in, um, employment in the UK. And it, it's not the, you know, it's not necessarily the, the large tech companies that are the most exciting to, to work for. Very often it's the smaller businesses that really want to change the way business functions mm -hmm. um, and that's so exciting you know when you write somebody's value proposition and they read it back and say oh god this is where I'd love to be in three years time but this is not where I am today and I said well look it is the essence of it is there you know your values your attitude your your enthusiasm your understanding and your ideas and your vision they are all there so you know set that set that peg a little bit higher and then you, you will find your business naturally strives to meet that and live and breathe those values. And you will find, again, it's that kind of if you do it often enough, that that is what you will become. So, you know, really kind of set, set that vision and, and you will you will grow into it. That's, that's yeah, that's brilliant. Lucy, it, any final? Well, no, I was just going to say it's really interesting how how many of us started in the corporate world or that we're speaking to started in the corporate world gained all the experience and then moved to an SME um, it's yeah. it's quite a, a, a I, I don't necessarily think it's because the corporate environment is is somehow less rewarding um, but I think it comes from the fact that when you are in a big corporation as I say you know my company was 18,000 but my one of my divisions my was was just forty people. Right. So effectively, we were a company within a company. We were a, a kind of a, a, a subsystem, um, and that was really like working in a startup environment because we we were were in quite a you know it was a very senior niche. The kind of deals we were doing were you know three hundred and fifty million dollar deals over you know a, a sort of a, a ten year contract period. Um, but it, it, it made us kind of different from the rest of the company and very tight knit. So actually that, you know, being transplanted out of that large, um, very comfortable, very buffered environment into a smaller business was not the shock to the system that, that you know, I might have anticipated yeah. because the dynamic was really very similar. Um, and I think equally, you know, with the again, the way technology is, is delivering today, we have really sophisticated tools we have self-service platforms for creating content and managing business that we couldn't have dreamed of 15 20 years ago so working in a small business is not substantially different in terms of what you can access to create this sense of being bigger than bigger than you are and really projecting a confidence into the market and, and instilling a confidence in your clients that you know startups of 20 years ago it would have been beyond their reach so I think technology's played a massive role in enabling people to hop in and out of different different environments and um, different scales of organisation. And then you just need some people with some passion who, where technology doesn't do the answer, you know who to call. Absolutely. You this need is copywriting. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and this is the other thing is that there are a whole network of, of smaller businesses. And I think we owe it to one another, not just to provide the services that are required to, you know, keep the plates spinning, 
but also the solidarity and the support and the empathy and the understanding and that ability to be able to compare notes and say, yes, I struggled with that. And then I, I found a way of overcoming it and really to kind of cross fertilize, not within our own sort of immediate discipline, um, but, but, but out into other disciplines as well, because there are so many more things we have in common than are, than, than are you know, dissimilar. Mm -hmm. yeah. thank you this has been a really lovely session thank you very much for coming along and talking to us um yeah just it's been great and um, yeah just thank you for sharing your story such yeah, a pleasure thanks, thank you thank you